Hi, my name is Chris Dalgan. I'm the owner of Sound Smugglers Tour in Salem and also the author of Sound Secret Underground and its uh, sequel, Sub Rosa, coming out in October. And in this series, we're going to talk about the series of tunnels within Salem, Mass, and the conspiracies to build them. Before we get that far, we're going to talk about America's first millionaire, Liza Haskett Derby. He's actually still ranked the 10th richest person in American history. He made that fortune first off the bat as a privateer. Now, if you wonder what difference between a privateer and a pirate is, it's just a piece of paper. Now, the most famous pirate we have is Blackbeard. Actually, he started off life as a privateer, but forgot to do his paperwork. So, after the war, the Revolutionary War, Liza Haskett Derby went into the mercantile trade and he opened up ports in Sumatra where his secret pepper stash was. Also, his ship, the Grand Turk, was the second ship to ever sail from America to China. And actually, the supercargo Thomas Perkins that he had hired, we will uh, mention a lot about him later on in the story. So, Eliza, being the America's first millionaire, he didn't start off that way just on his own. He was actually would be married to Mary Crown and Shield. See, now back in Salem, he had two powerful families. One was the Derbys, who were actually uh, Federalists. Now, the Crown and Shields, where Mary Crown and Shield was from, they were Democratic Republicans. So the Democratic Republicans, they favored Jefferson, and the Federalists liked Adams. So upon this marriage, the um, father of uh, Liza had bought the couple this house. This house now stands on Derby Street across from Derby Wharf. Now, the question in town was, now this is like marrying today, like say the Bushes into the Clinton family. Upon a marriage like this, first of all, I mean, they're political opposites. So what's going on here? It's called game theory. Well, you take two political parties and make sure it's not a third or fourth because then you could split the shares down in half. Well, everyone else thinks in town you guys are actually fighting each other, but actually you're working together like Pepsi and Coke with their taste challenges that put all the other sodas out of business back in the 80s. So another question after the people realized that, you know, it got past the fact that these two politically opposed families are marrying into each other, the question was, why build such a strong political family, this marriage, these, this new couple, a brick house? See, the problem in Salem was that nobody ever wanted to live in a brick house. There was once a man who had lived in one. He caught a cold and died. So ever since then, nobody ever wanted to live in a brick house in Salem. So why were these couple moving into this home? The next question they would ask is, what is with the third floor windows? If you look at the picture carefully, they're actually smaller than the first two floors. Well, this concept originally starts off in um, Amsterdam or in Holland. See, the thing was that they, this is where the Cape Cod houses originated from. And in Holland at that time, they were trying to get around property taxes. So if you put a second floor in the attic, you don't have to pay second floors worth of property taxes. Well, they won up it in Salem. So if you have uh, windows on the third floor that were half the size, then you don't have to pay your taxes on the third floor. So this leads to the next question. People in Sam realize that, you know, the derbies or the crown issues might be a little cheap by not wanting to pay a third floor in property tax. Then what's with the exterior chimneys? There's four of them. Now, all the way up to probably about the 60s, you know, there would always be a central chimney. You know, eventually your heating system would go through it, but previously it would be actually a fireplace. And the idea of a central chimney is that all four sides of that chimney will heat your home. That's why today's fireplaces are so useless, because three sides of the chimney are exposed to the elements. Now in this house in the picture, there's four chimneys with one face per, per side exposed to the elements. So if they were so cheap and not wanting to pay an extra floor in taxes, why are they wasting all that heating cost? Another question they were asking is, 
Well, it took a year to put this roof on this house. Very slow construction, they were thinking. Plus, the pile of bricks used to build the home was three times the house's finished size. Now, this style of home goes back to the architect Charles Bullfinch. Bullfinch would be famous for creating um, a series of homes, or a style of homes called Federalist, that would utilize these fireplace arches in the chimneys. Now what he was doing was, he was alleviating an old problem to, with homes that were connected to tunnels. The problem was now, when your tunnel came to the house, and you had a simple doorway between the two of them, there could be a flashing problem. There could be water dripping on your head as the, the seepage coming from the ground above finds that little fault between the tunnel and the home. Well, Bullfinch realized that what happens if you actually bring the tunnel into the house through the fireplace arch in the basement? Well, you alleviate that flashing problem. The other thing it does is somewhere in a tunnel there's an opening. And since nature abhors vacuums, as you open up the door to the tunnel into the home, air is pulled up through that chimney through the flue, leaving empty spaces behind that new air needs a rush to fill. So every time you open up the door to your home, it creates a draw system, bringing fresh air into the tunnels, much like you see today's street workers who always have a fan and uh, bellows going into the, the uh, tunnels that they're working in. So, also about those bricks, well, they weren't really just using the bricks to build the home. The Derbys had a cousin, and he lived directly behind him on the corner of Essex and Orange Street. These cousins, the father and son, were the founder of the organization, the Salem East India Marine Society, who were the founders of what the museum we call today the PBD Essex Museum. And the Derbys needed to have a tunnel coming from their wharf past their house to the cousin's house on the corner of Essex and Orange Street. So that's where all the extra bricks were going. Well, the Derbys were staying in this house for a short period of time, and they would need larger homes in Salem. The first house they built was right next to it, which is today called the Hawks House. Well, they never moved into that home. They just used it as a storage space for when uh, Liza was sending all his ships off to sea, robbing the British during the Revolutionary War. Eventually, they would then move out of the brick house and bypass the Hawks House completely, and they would move into a mansion that sits currently where the Mason Lodge is on Washington Street in Salem. They lived in that house long enough until they were able to move into their grand palace. This mansion here was Derby's fourth and final mansion. It was based on uh, mansions that were in Venice that was owned by the Medicis. In front of it was Front Street. And at that time, it was actually the South River. And people would come to balls at this home, buy gondola, and come up the grand entranceways through the gardens to the house. Now, Derby, he would only be able to live in his home for about a year before he dies. Now, his son, Eliza Haskett Derby Jr., would actually come and take over this mansion. But today, it is a current location of Old Town Hall. Old Town Hall was also built by Bull French, who we were mentioning a little bit earlier. Now, here's a picture of Derby, or at least Jr. He would be America's first playboy so he comes back from India and Egypt, where he was running his father's mercantile industry. Liza Haskett Derby Jr., within two years of retirement in Salem, would spend his share of America's first millionaire's inheritance. Remember, this inheritance is equal to what is the 10th richest man in American history's inheritance. Also, the upkeep in the mansion was so grand that also put a little pinch in his budget. So he's going to have to look for a day job. 
And at the same time as he's looking for a day job, there's a hot contested election going on between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson would come out the winner in this battle between the two of them, and it would, some call it, a silent revolution. Now Adams, he was previously the ambassador to England. He loved everything about England. He was leading towards creating America as an aristocracy. He would love to be America's first king. Granted, Jefferson did go overseas and offer the throne of America to the Stuart pretender and seeing if he would like to uh, reign in America. But the Stuart had seen what we did to our previous king and denied the offer. And Washington came back and became president. Now we get up to Adams and he's looking to create a monarchy again. So when Jefferson won, it was called a silent revolution because even though we, the Constitution didn't go as far as maybe Jefferson wanted, his hopes was that the average person could move west into areas that were unsettled and with them owning property would gain the right to vote. And with this vote, America wouldn't be an aristocracy for that much longer. So now back with Eliza Haskett Derby, he's heard or he caught wind that Jefferson, while he's in office, he wants to have the customs coming into the Salem port and all the ports in America have new custom duties. And a lot of these supporters of Adams, these Federalists, they don't want to pay these duties. So we'll come up to the Salem Commons next. Originally, the Salem Commons had five ponds and a river leading out towards um, down Forrester Street out to Collins Cove. Now, originally it was quite industrial in nature with brass foundries, uh, rope walks, uh, tanneries, bakeries. Now in 1801, Liza Haskett Derby Jr. is going to put forth to the town that he's thinking about beautifying this commons here. So Eliza Haskell Derby Jr. is going to put together these subscribers to the Salem Commons Improvement Fund. And what they're going to do first is fill in all those ponds, level the hills, get rid of the marshland, and put a nice wooden fence around the commons. And he's going to use the local militia to do it. Now Jefferson had asked that the local militia help collect on, on these duties. At the time that Liza Haskett Derby Jr. was putting together this park, this beautification plan, the local militia was actually kind of defunct. So before Jefferson or somebody else in town could reorganize a militia, Liza Haskett Derby Jr. had put together one himself. Even though that this militia that was on the Salem Commons were actually the first National Guard unit in American history, started back in the early 1600s, he's going to have a new purpose for them. So at the time when Eliza Haskett Derby Jr. was putting together the new um, militia, these are their uniforms. And it was become very smart, or at least to look smart set, that you would join this militia so you can have these uniforms and impress the ladies about town. And all the wealthy started becoming colonels and generals, and after a few years, Liza Haskell Derby Jr. would move himself up to being general of the second cadets. So today, this is what the commons looks like. So the ponds are missing. The river leading out to the Collins Cove is gone. And beyond the tree line, the wooden fence is removed for an iron fence. Now also, if you look around this picture, you see these rooftops of these fine mansions. So what Derby's doing is trying to get rid of the, all this industrial nature, these rope walks and tanneries and brass foundries, and he's trying to convince his subscribers, the wealthy of town and politicians, to actually build fine mansions going around it. 
And some of these subscribers would include, and people who would move off the commons, be Associate Superior Court Justice, Joseph Story, another person who would pay for beautification of the park, would be Secretary of the Navy, Benjamin Crown and Shield. And also paying for the beautification is Secretary of State, Timothy Pickering under Adams in Washington. He was Washington's aide de camp, and also he's a person who led the first resistance to the British forces in American Revolutionary War at the old North Street Bridge in Salem, Mass. Also, we have uh, another subscriber, it's Nathaniel Silsby, or Senator Silsby, and also Senator Benjamin Pickman. Now, what I wasn't mentioning about the uh, beautification program and the filling in of all those ponds is the fact that as they were leading a bunch of tunnels around the commons connected to all those new mansions and in all these homes of the people I just mentioned around the commons or throughout town, they were taking all the dirt and hiding that inside those ponds in the river leading out to Collins Cove. In fact, they would remove the breadth of uh, Collins Cove and actually fill in many of the different areas which are now called Webb and Milk Street around that cove to hide the tunnel dirt. Other members of the Salem Commons Improvement Fund included Stephen White, who is going to raise up to be the head of the National Republican Party, which turns into the Whigs for Massachusetts. Also included, there was Liza Haskett Derby Jr. and his various relatives, and also relatives of the Crown and Shields and the Peabody family. Beyond these members at the Salem Improvement Fund, there were Stephen White, who was the head of the National Republicans, who became the Whigs for Massachusetts. There was also another Secretary of State, Daniel Webster, would be involved in these tunnels. They would also be half the custom agency. The head of the customs, Joseph Hiller, was one of the smugglers in town. The weighers and gaugers for the custom agency also were part of this scheme. The captain of the revenue cutter out in the harbor who was supposed to be helping collect on these duties also was a member. Also, most of the masons we founded that year were also smugglers. So, you know, according to this list, there was one Social Superior Court Justice, two Secretaries of State, a Secretary of the Navy, three or four Senators, the local mayors, half the custom agency, and most of the ship captains and merchants in town related to the derbies and the crown and shields. Well, we'll take a look at other places that they uh, filled in in Salem. Now, this photograph here, on top of the hill closest to us, is where currently the Salem Post Office is. Looking, what would that be? That would be pretty much southeast from where the post office is, or where Raleigh Plaza is now, was Mill Pond. So in this to the left would be the Self River coming in there, which would be now Derby Street. And also that Grand Train Station would have been in that location where the water is. So this gives you a good idea of how much fill and how much tunnels you were digging and where all that tunnel dirt went. In this picture is what the uh, current location looks like now. This is Riley Plaza, Washington Street, Canal Street, and Washington Street. So it looks a lot different. Now, just up from this last two pictures is the house of Josh, Joshua Ward. This is the last seafront property from that time period left in Salem. Granted, Washington Street sits in front of it now and it's far away from the uh, South River, but it's still the last seafront property uh, from that time period that's left in Salem. So Joshua Ward, he was married to Edward Augustus Holyoke's daughter. Now Edward Augustus Holyoke was another smuggler in town and he's also the founder of the New England Medical Journal. Now Joshua Ward was also a ship captain 
And across the street where today the Adriatic is, or the old Salem News Building, was his wharf that was on the South River. And he would also have a home that was built by Charles Bullfinch, or at least designed by Bullfinch's techniques. And here's a picture of Bullfinch. Bullfinch, at the War of 1812, or at its conclusion, would become the architect of DC. He's the one who rebuilds the Capitol and most of its buildings. And he's also the man who connects all those buildings together by a series of elaborate tunnels. Still today, you can go to the um, Library of Congress and, and move between the Jefferson and the Adams building by six levels of tunnel, which are actually open to the public. So if you're ever in DC, go ahead, take a stroll through some of those tunnels. But over here, there's a statue of Joshua Ward. Seems to be a quite jolly fellow. And this here is his portrait that would hang in the Salem Marine Society. Now, the Salem Marine Society was a group of ship captains that would either sail around the Cape of South America or sail around the Cape of Africa. And they would bring back their nautical knowledge and their maps or cartography. And they would also be involved in making local harbors safer for each other and building lighthouses like the two lights that would be out on Baker Island in the Salem Harbor. Today, their clubhouse still resides on top of the Hawthorne Hotel, for it was Thomas Perkins who gave the property to the Salem Marine Society, who eventually would sell it to Frank Poor, the founder of Sylvania, so he would have a hotel for his business clients. But they would only sell it to him unless they were able to keep their clubhouse on top of the building. Now, back to the Joshua Ward's house. When Washington needed to take a tour of New England to win over the New England Federalists on his second election, he would stay at the Joshua Ward house. Him being a Mason and all, would want to be where the Masons hang out. See, now when in 1801, when the Mason Lodge had reformed after the Revolutionary War, Joshua Ward gave them quarters in his house to meet. So of course, George Washington, being a fellow Mason, would want to stay in the, the Mason Lodge. He would stay in the second floor on the right, if you're looking at the front of the building. At this time period, he was going to have a grand party while he was in town in his honor. So he'll be the first of our presidents to be able to walk through the tunnels. He was able to walk through that tunnel, which along what's now Washington Street, to the corner of Washington, Essex, where the Fountain Diner is today. In that building, there was originally in that location, it was called the Stearns Building, and they had an assembly hall where they gave a grand party for Washington. And at his closing, he was able to go back through those tunnels, back to the Joshua Ward House, unmolested by the quick sketch artists or the paparazzi of his, their day. Another president who was probably able to walk through our tunnels was John Quincy Adams. Now John Quincy Adams has been coming to Salem since he was a young boy visiting his um, cousin. His cousin eventually married Bartholomew Felt. Bartholomew Felt was one of the uh, founding Mormons. In fact, Brigham Young was at his house when they had news that Joseph Smith was assassinated. Another president who was able to walk through our tunnels was James Monroe. He had come to town on bequest of his Secretary of the Navy, Benjamin Crownishield. So he was put up in his house, which was attached to tunnels. Then he was entertained at Daniel Silsby's house, which was attached to tunnels. Also, he was able to visit Stephen White's home, which was connected to tunnels. So either they were laughing at the president or allowing him to walk through the tunnels between all these houses and the parties in town. George Washington, he got to be in the Mason Lodge, which was Joshua Ward's home. You could see him in his uh, Masonic gear. Now, the thing about Masons is they're famous for building tunnels. Uh, they usually refer to the tunnels in North End of Boston as Mason tunnels. So we'll take a look at one of the tunnels he might have been able to walk through. This tunnel is dead center, coming out from the front of the Joshua Ward House, which is the um, Merchant Hotel, I believe, now in Salem. So for $500 a night, you might be able to get a room that's haunted 
We'll talk about that in a minute. And maybe the room Washington slept in. But this tunnel here would lead off to Joshua Ward's wharf across the street. And he was moving so many goods, he had a identical tunnel to the left and another one to the right. So actually, time would go by and there was this company called Ghibli's. And before 1950, they had a building right in front of the Joshua Ward house. And they would actually use these tunnels to move goods from the Joshua Ward house where they use it as a warehouse to their showroom that was on Washington Street. Also in this location was, uh, I think first was Jerry's, Jerry's Army and Navy, that's very famous in Salem too. So imagine in a day, on a cold wintry night, you needed to get a cup of coffee. Granted, Dunkin' Donuts wasn't around at that time, but if it was, you would be able to use this particular tunnel to probably walk into the Dunkin' Donuts basement, come up and get your coffee, and go back down again and reach the safety of your home without ever touching any snow. But also in this picture, you could actually see that how far these tunnels extended into the homes that were connected to the tunnels, completely alleviating any kind of flashing problem. Now, I did mention ghosts inside the house. This picture here was taken during a Christmas party. The man who owned the Joshua Ward house in the 80s had a real estate company. And they actually had this one woman, Julia Teche, who would go on and own her own real estate companies in the future, was standing on a staircase and they took a Polaroid of her. And when they shook the film, waiting for it to develop, this started to be exposed behind her. Now, why would there be a woman on the stairs, or a ghost even, behind her? See, on this property was the home of Sheriff Corwin. Now, Sheriff Corwin was that uh, sheriff who uh, pressed Giles Corey to death and took the end of his cane and shoved his tongue back down his throat. Not the friendliest guy. So he's also the sheriff who arrested everyone else in Salem during their witchcraft trials. But he never made a whole lot of money. And within five years, he fell to Giles Corey's curse. Corey said that all sheriffs of Essex County would die gasping on their own blood or, or blood ailments. Granted, even a sheriff in 1990 took it to heart after he had a heart attack. and went on to write a series of um, local legend books and it became one of the people who founded the um, Salem Haunted Happenings, too. So, back to Sheriff Corwin. Five years after the witchcraft trials, he actually would die gasping on his own blood. Now, he died in debt to Mr. Philip English, I believe. Now, back then, when you were in debt, the person you were in debt to could actually put a lien on your body until your heirs can pay off that debt. Well, Sheriff Corrin's wife buried him in the basement underneath the staircase before uh, Philip English could get a hold of his body. This is like a symbol of um, Jacob's Ladder or Stairway to Heaven. There'll be other locations in town, like underneath the old bank property on the corner of Derby Square in Essex, where it has two people, two runaway slaves, buried in a tomb underneath another staircase. So years went by and the wife was able to pay off the debt and also the town quieted down a little bit. I mean, if she tried burying her husband right after he died, most of the town felt foolish and they wanted a little bit of revenge for feeling so guilty of what they allowed to happen. And they could have probably pulled Sheriff Corrin's body into quarters and put each of those quarters onto posts on the cardinal points in town. But time goes by and she was able to safely bury her husband in the Broad Street Cemetery next to where the son of the author who wrote The Exorcist now resides.
Hi, my name is Chris Dalgan. I'm the owner of Sound Smugglers Tour in Salem and also the author of Sound Secret Underground and its uh, sequel, Sub Rosa, coming out in October. And in this series, we're going to talk about the series of tunnels within Salem, Mass, and the conspiracies to build them. Here's a picture of the uh, old train tracks that used to be running right in front of Joshua Ward's house. Now, a little bit further up the road, you can see the original train tunnel. So there you can see the picture of Jerry's that would be in front of the Joshua Ward house that had a tunnel running to it. Now in the previous picture, and in this picture here too, you realize that the tunnel starts way past this point. That's because he didn't want to disturb Joshua Ward's tunnels by the train tracks. But by 1950, most of the smuggling was over. So there was no real worry about putting the current train tunnel in that runs the whole length of Washington Street, which would have disturbed tunnels going from one end to the other. In this picture is one of the banks to the right that was originally built by Stephen White. He had started his bank, the Asiatic Bank, on the lower floors of the East India Marine Hall, which is now part of the Peabody Essex Museum, and also his Oriental Insurance Company. He goes on to build this building and allows the Odd Fellows to have their lodge in it. Currently, the building is still there, but they took off the top two floors and replaced them with a new third floor. Currently, it had up to Probably last winter, the Eastern Bank resided in that spot. Now, Stephen White had got together a bunch of different bankers in town and had them all decide to have their bank in this building, which is kind of strange because every other location they were at, they had tunnels attached to their buildings as well. So it still remains a mystery why they all had to settle on this one location. Now, next to it, is a Dana Lowe building, which currently has Rockefellers in it. Originally, it was the uh, first church to its building, and this was their fifth erection on that site. Now, in the next picture, shows you the old vault that's inside the Dana Lowe's building. And you can see the door coming out the back that would lead to the alleyway if it wasn't bricked up. Previously to that being a service entrance, it was probably a back door entrance to this vault. There was a bank in the building before Daniel Lowe's bought the whole bottom floor and then eventually the whole building. And this would have been their vault. Today, uh, Rockefellers, the restaurant above, uses it to hide all their hard liquor so that their staff doesn't drink it while they're not looking. In the next picture, you can actually see the vault that would the uh, door that would keep the employees from drinking the liquor when they're not looking. Here is the building that originally stood on location here. This was the first congregational church in the country. It may even be said, maybe one of the first churches in the country or church building. So eventually this would be moved to where currently Walgreens is on the corner of Boston and Bridge. Now, this is the tunnel coming out of the back right corner. If you're facing Essex Street from the corner of Washington to Essex, looking at the front facade of the Daniel Lowe building. Above, you could see every three feet, there's an archway with a metal rim. This might look very familiar if you uh, look up, say, if you're traveling to Boston subway. This is probably the right amount of spacing for an arch to hold up say subway cars, or maybe cars driving above in the alleyway. Same thing we'd be able to see later at the uh, Mason Lodge further up Washington Street, where their tunnel also went across an alleyway. Also, you could see to the left there, a little nook where you could put a lantern down as you're trying to work your keys to get back into the building. Now, in the floor here, it said when Daniel Lowe had purchased the building, he had heard rumors that the state were coming in 
to commemorate all the buried souls that were underneath the floor of his tunnel. This was one of the many locations in town that when a runaway slave would die on the Underground Railroad, they would be buried. So Daniel Lowe, before the state could come in and turn his tunnel, they ran to his warehouse that he moved goods back and forth to, from warehouse to showroom, decided, well, I want to concrete it shut before they could commemorate them, forever like fermenting or you know preventing any of the state from doing anything to commemorate these souls. So granted, in the future, it also becomes ha haunted as well. Now right above that entrance in the last picture is this metal plate with these glass circles in it. This is exposed to the sidewalk above. If you go in the alleyway behind Rockefeller's or Daniel Lowe's building, you will see um, a raised uh, platform or a staircase going into the building. And just to the left of it, you could see this other side of this metal plate with the glass. Now what this does in the tunnels is it allows light to be brought into the tunnels, usually around where the door to the um, building leaving the tunnel is. So this way you got light to work your keys. Now this next picture is of me in the middle of that tunnel where all those um, poor souls are buried underneath from the uh, Underground Railroad. In the next picture, this is the other end. This is the end leaving his warehouse. Um, Previously, this would have been a building up to about a year or two that had the goddess treasure chests in the, um, the basement office. And this is the third building of the, that the first church erected on the location. Now in front of it, the little sign coming out of the, above its doorway, that was the building that during the Revolutionary War, when uh, the British invaded Boston, John Hancock took the state government and actually held court in that building for a month or two. Now, the train tunnel, before 1950, this is where it began. And I guess you could say that maybe they built this train tunnel to alleviate traffic problems in the corner of Essex and Washington Street. As you can tell, there's a whole lot of cars and imagine all the accidents with that much traffic. And this is actually the other end. Very tiny tunnel. It's coming out currently near where the Tabernacle Church is on Washington Street. Well, a little further up the road, above that train tunnel to the uh, right, is a Kinsman building. Currently, Opus and the Little French Bakery resides in there. Now, John Kinsman, he was a superintendent of the Eastern Railroad. Now, the Eastern Railroad was originally owned and founded by George Peabody. We'll talk about him a little bit later. Now, what Kinsman planned was that the back of his building would have eight tunnels, eight, eight separate tunnel systems that were running through town, connect to his building, and one tunnel, this one in the picture, leading out toward the front so that everyone in town, if they didn't want to sell their goods within Salem, they could actually smuggle it onto this train and either bring raw goods to build the new city's Lowell and Lawrence. They could bring the goods to Boston to um, further bring the goods maybe to New Bedford, the rest of the country. Also, there's one sad note about this train tunnel is that, now as we had these runaway slaves coming through Salem, part of the Underground Railroad, they would be trying to, you know, look for employment. Maybe not all of them wanted to go to Canada, and they could maybe be tempted by some unscrupulous few. So if you could get this far in the tunnels, how hard is it to say that somebody might, you know, take one or two of them, or a couple hundred or a thousand, put them on a train, and bring them up to those new mill cities, and work them in sweatshops where they could never complain? Well, it's never been written, so there's no real proof. But you can assume people would probably do that to another person, unfortunately. Now, and this is a tunnel that's running behind that entrance. So probably beforehand, before the Kinsman building was built, there was probably a building to the left of this tunnel and a building to the right. Now, it's just one of the many hallways 
underneath the Kinsman building. And also above, there is the corrugated steel that at one time was supporting a sidewalk between those two buildings. In the next picture, this is the largest sealed up tunnel entrance that I found within Salem. So if you go to that bar Opus and go into the basement, hear a good band, get a drink at the bar, and then look behind the bartender. That's the largest sealed up tunnel entrance in town. So John Kinsman, that we see in this picture, he had a hell of a deal going on and did many of these people end up in Lowell in this textile factory. They end up working in sweatshops. Who knows if many of them did or not? And were they sitting there toiling with these machines with very low labor and could never complain? Today, if you stand at the Salem train station and you look to your right, you can actually see into the current train tunnel. And it's a little hard to see, but right above to the right are these buildings, the county uh, courthouses and the registry of deeds. All three of them will be connected by tunnels and at one point connected to that train tunnel as well. This is a tunnel that's leaving the registry of deeds. I got to sneak in there one day when I wasn't supposed to be. And I was walking some distance until I come across a submerged room. Inside the submerged room, there was a man sitting at a desk. So I decided I'll walk really quick at this point so the man won't see me. So I did get to the Superior Court and I didn't find a way to get to the um, the other court that's on the corner of Essex and Washington Street. Also, I heard stories about a room. My friend, he had worked for the Registry of Deeds at one point, and he would get summer interns, these you know, different women who would end up working underneath him, and he would tell them, I want you to go through that tunnel, and I want you to open up the door in the tunnel into the room. And your job for the afternoon is to go inside there and alphabetize all the photographs you find. Little did he tell them that the photographs were of all the murders that happened in Essex County. So he might not have been the friendliest at times. So about two years ago, they were doing some construction behind the uh, Red Tree of Deeds. And this is what they exposed. So dead center, you can see the door of where I left the Red Tree of Deeds. And if you follow the picture on a 45 degree angle to the bottom left, you could see where that tunnel I had showed you previously was atop top in that room with the man who was sitting below in. And I didn't get to see that little room off that submerged room that could have led to where the photographs were or maybe the tunnel that was leading to the courthouse on Washington and Federal Street. But afterwards, I was telling my friend this story about the man down in this large room. And he looked at me funny and he said, you idiot, that was me. And I was probably sleeping on the job and even if I was awake, I would probably let you go in and see that tunnel. So little do I know. Now, this is actually that mansion I was talking about earlier. This is the Pickman Derby Brookhouse Mansion. It's a mansion that Liza Haskett Derby had lived in while he was building his grand mansion where Old Town Hall is now. And you can see the four exterior chimneys on this house. So when the Masons bought the property to build their lodge, it came with tunnels already. They didn't have to build them this time. So this is a tunnel that would head off to uh, Line Street or Lindy Street. I never got that right yet. Now, this other picture here, above is where at one time there was an alleyway, but now it's a one floor um, partition that connects to the building where the Griffin Theater is at this point. So you can see those arches up in the ceiling, like I said, it would be in subways or it was in a tunnel at the Daniel Bowes building. And a funny story about this door here is the woman who has shown me it. If you could barely see it in the top right, there's a latch that pulls down. Well, it was rusted. 
And I gave a good five minutes at trying to open up that, that latch there to open up this door. And the woman finally looked at me and said, oh, don't worry, we can just walk around this wall and you can see the other side. Here is the original uh, Lyceum building. Now the Lyceum was a building where the average person could come inside and get a um, education. So people like John Quincy Adams would do talks about politics. Hawthorne was a secretary booking everybody. His father-in-law, uh, Dr. Peabody, was selling the tickets. Um, Longfellow would come and do readings here. James Russell Lowell would read um, Dante's Inferno for one of the first times in English. And also, the Salem Boys fraternity would be in this building after the Lyceum leaves, which is kind of funny or strange since this was the only building out of the three different buildings in town that they resided in and during those days that wasn't made out of bricks. I mean, the first time they stumbled upon it, for, you know, the first building was made out of brick. This would be in their second one. And they learned to put the kids back in a brick building again because they did actually create Inferno in this building and burn it down. So. James Russell Lowell was the only person who had an inferno inside this building. One of the other famous people who would do lectures here was Frederick Douglass. Now, Frederick Douglass was invited to town by the Ramans. Now, the Ramans were famous in the abolitionist circuit inside America and in Europe. This is a picture of the sister, Sarah Parker Remond. Sarah would own a hairdressing salon in her day in Salem before she leaves to go to Europe. Her siblings would also own uh, laundries. Her father had owned uh, Hamilton Hall, the most famous caterer in town. In total, her family had 10 businesses in Salem, them being African-American and part Ararat tribe, the same tribe Tichuba is from. The Ararat tribe hail from Curacao, an island off of Venezuela, and also made it off to Barbados and the other Caribbean islands in that area. Also, the Redmonds had hosted the first African-American woman who ever went off to get a college education. Now remember, Sarah was a hairdresser, and Frederick Douglass has always had these amazing hairstyles. So, I think Sarah knew him even in his later life. Now, to be amazed, you should see what her brother's haircut was. Now, it was funny. The first time I'd seen a picture of John Remond, I was walking off. After I found a photograph of him, I was walking to the Hawthorne Hotel, and I still had the picture in my hand. And I go in the Hawthorne Hotel, and I see these feet of my friend coming down the stairs. My friend is also born in the Caribbean, just like John Raymond was. And he also was working, especially that day, as a caterer. Well, Raymond was you know, raised in his father's catering company. Now, when my friend's body came to sight, where I could see his head, he decided to shape half of his afro off that Halloween. So I thought to myself, if there is reincarnation, I think I found out where John Raymond ended up in his next life. Now, John Raymond, who is also the recruiter for the 54th and 55th Regiment that is famous from that movie, uh, Glory, with Matthew Broderick. Now, this is the Jacob Rush storefront. Today, it's Cabot Wealth Management resides in it. You can see the four exterior chimneys again. This was the first brick storefront that was connected to the tunnels in, in town. Now, it reminds me of a story where I grew up in Whiting, New Jersey, out in the Pine Barrens, where we're famous for blowing up the Hindenburg. There was a Chinese family up the road from me, and they would stand on their property waiting for a bus. Every time this Chinese family would sell a house to another Chinese family, they would actually get the Chinese restaurant as part of the deal. Now, the only thing cooler in Salem was that once you buy a house and it's connected to a business, it really was connected to a business because Jacob Russ's house 
which is on Essex Street, closer to the Salem Library, is actually connected to this building through tunnels. Better deal than the Chinese got in my neighborhood. And here is one of the many tunnels coming out of that basement. Now, Jacob Rust's house was famous just by accident for when they were filming Lords of Salem, uh, the Rob Zombie's wife resided in this house to the right. So if you ever see the movie, this is the house she's walking in and out of uh, trying to get to her apartment where a couple of the murders and scenes happen and such and such. But to the left is Jacob Rust's house. And if you go behind the home and you'll see there's elaborate L-shaped basement entrance, you just look down into one of the old tunnels because why would you want a new hole in your building when you already have one? So you just take the roof of the tunnel off, put a staircase down, blocking the tunnel going any further in one direction, and you put a door into your uh, home. Now you got a new basement entrance. Now the filming of Lords of Salem also went to the Green Lawn Cemetery. And inside the Green Lawn Cemetery is this chapel. Now, the connection between Jacob Rustjor and this chapel is that the back of this church has a uh, Bilko door. Now, the thing about Bilko doors and basement entrances is that in these 1800 houses, they're not historical. They didn't have weed whackers. They didn't have lawn mowers. There was no need to have access to the basement from your backyard. So later on, when you did need access to these basements, you take, like I mentioned before, you take the roof of the tunnel off, the staircase going down blocks the tunnel from going any further from your building, and you already have the hole into your home where the tunnel door used to be. So same thing inside this chapel. Its back door actually points off to where Joseph Cabot had bought property. Now Joseph Cabot, he was a mayor, uh, the first mayor of the city of Salem in the 1800s when it wasn't a town no more and they decided to make it a city. Now on the property where Joseph uh, Cabot resided is now the Cabot Farm. And a road leading up to it is very badly humped from the erosion around the tunnel leading off to the two houses at the end of that road. The road terminates into a marshy field and the two parts that are always high and dry is what you can see of the tunnel mound cutting through it which then forks off to either house. But be careful walking on this public road at night because you might wake up the guard rooster. The llama doesn't mind if he sees you but the guard rooster crows. Then you get the pickup truck that comes out of the house and up and down the road, wondering what you're doing, walking on that public road past the public playground. By the time you get to the end of the road, the cop car comes out, wondering what you were doing, walking on that public road. Now, back before the Cabots owned that property, it was Orn's Point. And it was Orn who had put Joseph Peabody and Eliza Hasker Derby to their trade. They started off in his counting house. And somewhere in his descendants, there was a widow who was afraid of losing that property on the, uh, the river there with the smuggling tunnels leaving off from the houses. Well, someone of her family was digging in the yard and found a vein, a terracotta. Now this is around the time that everyone's building tunnels in town. And you know, terracotta makes great bricks. So one of the people who ended up purchasing from her, of many people in town that would save her from losing the property, would be Timothy Pickering. That's Secretary of State of Adams in Washington. Well, he puts in an order of 250,000 bricks from the widow. Back when it took about 8,000 bricks to maybe make a house. So you gotta wonder where all those extra bricks were going. Now back to that uh, chapel. The other tunnel would head off to the west. After you go down a staircase, leaving the chapel, you would enter this room. In this room is where they would put 
corpses in in the winter time for the ground was too solid and too frozen back before you had earth movers and heavy equipment they needed a place to store the bodies and no one was using this particular part of the tunnel at the time so they would put the corpses inside these little sliding tombs here today Occasionally, you might find maybe a weed whacker inside one of them, or just some random garbage. There's also a tunnel that went to the other direction as well, that left the building, made a little curve, and then lets you get up two steps of, of the staircase before it's sealed off. Above, there was a greenhouse. But that tunnel led off to Manning's property, where Manning was uh, Hawthorne's uncle and he had owned part of that graveyard where it was his nursery. It most likely led to the house that he allowed uh, Hawthorne's mother himself to stay in on the edges of that nursery. Here is the old bank building that's on the corner of Derby Square in Essex. Um, the last bank to be in here in the late 90s was Eastern Bank. Before that, it was Norm Keg Trust and then several beforehand. Now, the first one in here was the first bank in the county, the Essex Bank. They would leave this site and then they would enter into the, um, the building, the old boys club as they call it, next to Reds with the high staircase. That was their uh, building first. And then eventually the boys club got in there and they didn't burn it down because it was made out of brick. Another bank who entered this particular property in the photograph was the Salem Bank. Now the Salem Bank was founded by Edward Augustus Holyoke and on the side note he looks like my grandmother in drag. Now I have a photograph of me sitting on my grandmother's lap about the same age, same hair, same face, leaning, she's leaning on a table just like in this photograph here, or this painting. And where that quill is in the photograph of me and my grandmother, it's a lollipop uh, phone. Now the funny thing between my grandmother and Edward Augustus Holyoke is that Edward Augustus Holyoke's father's name is Edward, his grandfather's name is Edward, his great-grandfather's name is Edward, his son's name is Edward, his grandson's name is Edward. There are people who wanted their children to be doctors named all the way up into the 1970s named Edward Augustus Holyoke Smith or Edward Augustus Holyoke Jones. Now, my grandmother's father, you guessed it, is Edward. Her great-grandfather's name is Edward. Her father's name is Edward. Her firstborn son is Edward. Her brother, the first of her father's kids, was Edward. I have a cousin, Ed Joe, and he ended it. My grandmother was an RN and Edward Augustus Holyoke was a doctor who trained 100 people in Salem. He was the first dean of Harvard Medicine, as I mentioned before, founder of New England Medical Journal. And if there was reincarnation, I think my grandmother beat me to town. My name is Chris Dowgan. I'm the owner of the Salem Smugglers Tour in Salem and also the author of Salem's Secret Underground and its uh, sequel, Sub Rosa, coming out in October. And in this series, we're going to talk about the series of tunnels within Salem Mass and the conspiracies to build them. So coming out of that bank building is one of the other sealed up tunnel entrances. Now, we used to do these paranormal investigations in the basement. And this woman in the photograph said she was the most scared of the group. And you can see all these little circles around her. If you actually could see the original pictures, about 10 of them. Now, right after she had her picture taken, there was a man who was leading the expedition, a guy named Twitch. He only had one orb on his belly. But the woman who was most scared had 10 around her. So I guess they liked playing with her. And also in that box there, I found all the keys to all the branches of Eastern Bank on the North Shore. So I gave him a call up, gave the keys back, and asked one favor. If I could take the pictures of their tunnels in their basement on the Eastern Bank on, in Washington Street. 
They said no, so they were real grateful. So that rug in that last picture there, if you lifted it, you would see this. So now around, oh, maybe the 60s or so, they decided to convert all these tunnels off to have be conduits for utilities to run through them. So the same thing we're saying about basement entrances. Now, when you want to build, put the sewer line into your home, why would you dig a new hole? Just use the old one that connected your home to the tunnels. Also, underneath this property here, there was this secret door above a workbench. This would also come out onto Essex Street, right around where the um, Mud Puddle Tories had presided earlier. So here's the picture of the Downing Block. To the left is the Downing Block. The next building over used to house um, Bertram's Jewelry Store. And the next one, I think uh, it's a llama wool shop at this point. Different clothing made out of llama wool. So it gives you an idea where it is. So the building on the left has now witch teas in it and Turtle Alley, if you're familiar. Give you a placement. So the Downing Block was also another place where the Salem Bank had started off at. Also in here was the various museums that make up the Peabody Essex Museum. These were include the Essex Historical Museum, the Essex Natural History Museum, the Salem East India Marine Society um, Museum. You also had a Mason Lodge up there at one time. All different organizations that would need tunnels. Especially this is a place where the boys club, the first boys club in the country, first started in. So the thing about the boys club is the old Lyceum buildings connected to the tunnels. This building's connected to the tunnels. And also the old boys club or the uh, Essex Bank next to Reds is connected to the tunnels. So it makes you wonder, was there a Fagan in town and a bunch of artful dodgers running about robbing people and sneaking back into the tunnels? Who knows? But here's me sneaking into that tunnel. So if you go in between Witch's Tees and Turtle Alley, there's a doorway that would lead up to the old Gene Murray dance studio on the third floor. And there's a granite slab in front of that entrance. So this is me sneaking through the tunnel underneath that granite slab. And unfortunately, once I got underneath the granite slab, the tunnel was blocked off to the left and the right. Now, if I turned around and got myself out of that hole, this is what I would have seen at the end of that tunnel. It would have been this iron door with about three inches of glass in front of it. And if you could see to the left and right, a sealed up arches. So previous to all those buildings being on top, there were other buildings. So many times in town, what they do is they might take down, say six different buildings, like where that old bank building is on the corner of Derby Square, and connect all those foundations. And usually between those previous foundations would be the tunnels running. So this would have been a tunnel running between the building that would have been on the left and to the right. And like our modern restaurants, where you see the waitresses go in and out, there's one door for you going in and one door coming out. So these are the ways in and out that they were using to move cargo from these buildings into the tunnel. Now this tunnel also had a furnace that's underneath witch tees that had um, door vents opening up into the tunnel to keep people warm while they're moving their carts back and forth. Also, it's rumored that in either one of these buildings that they allowed people who were on the Underground Railroad to have a place to stay for the night. Now, underneath that section of witch tees, they probably were connected to multiple tunnels. So this is one of the tunnels coming out the front, and they're also connected to a tunnel coming out to the side we were previously looking at. If you come out from this room into the tunnels, you'd be facing another door straight across from it. This door would go into the section of the downing block, which is now below Turtle Alley, 
which would have been a different building at the time. So, bottom of this door is a mustache. And below that mustache, there's a mail slot. So this leads me to the question of, who on the Underground Railroad was leaving a forwarding address behind that they could reach get mail from? Next door is the East Center Marine Hall, which is now part of the Peabody Essex Museum. So Stephen White, who we're going to mention a lot more later, he incorporated the East Center Marine Society as an LLC so he can build this first permanent location for their museum. On the bottom floors, he would have his Asiatic Bank and his Oriental Insurance Company. Time went by and they started having some financial problems. So this is when George Peabody, who Peabody Mass is um, named after, came to their establishment and offered them enough money to bail out the museum. Today, it's called the Peabody Essex Museum because then when he gave the money, the museum became the Peabody Academy of Science. Now, George Peabody supposedly uh, was a poor relation of Joseph Peabody, one of the wealthiest um, merchants and ship captains in Salem. But supposedly being born destitute in what's now Peabody, which was once South Salem, he went to work for our brother in Newbyport, which is also famous for having some tunnels, into the dry goods business. From there, after he found out that his brother wasn't as successful as he would want him to be, he would move himself to Georgetown outside of Washington, D.C. And there he would meet a man, Elijah Riggs. There they would have even more successful dry goods business. They would also get into the business of cotton and slaves. When they got into cotton and slaves, they realized that it would be better to be in Baltimore where most of the um, market for either commodity was. After leaving Baltimore, George Peabody would go to London and in time to become a merchant banker. Now, as a merchant banker, he started trading off bonds, state bonds, in the creation of the Ohio Canal and some railroads. Now, he moved on past that to actually sell state bonds and also shares in the Second Bank of the United States. And one of the people he dealt closely with was Nathaniel Rothschild. Now, Rothschild could never get the ear of members of Parliament. So after he met George Peabody, he would make George Peabody flush with money so that he would have these grand balls to actually take his words and put it into the ears of members of parliament. Because members of parliament were kind of racist at that time and they would not talk directly to a man of Jewish persuasion. Now, Nathan Rothschild was one of the people who were engineering the um, Bank of England. So at one point in 1836, Andrew Jackson did not renew the charter to the Second Bank of the United States. So previous, right, leading up to Rothschild's death, he would work with Peabody to first extend a whole lot of credit to America. And then as businesses were growing, they stopped growth by not extending any more credit. Then the next thing they did was that they stopped respecting any currency stock or bond from America, which drove American currency into the ground. So now that you owed money to England, you had to pay back three times as much as you borrowed because the value of your money you're paying with had declined so bad. This is one of the reasons that led into the 1837 panic. Also, if you wonder why Jackson was taking off of the $20 bill recently, it is because he got rid of the Second Bank of the United States, which today we call the Federal Reserve, or maybe you can maybe call it the Third Bank of the United States. The other thing 
that George Peabody is famous for is there was a time when the British were actually building a navy for the South. And here's a picture of the Confederate cruiser Alabama, the first and only one they successfully built for them. Now, J.P. Morgan, the son of Julius Spencer Morgan, who was George Peabody's partner for, it was then called Peabody Morgan and Company, he got a hold of a story about building that Alabama. And he heard that there was a second boat being built. So he goes up to the, uh, the Prime Minister of England at the day and asks, what can we do to stop you from building any more ships for the South? And the Prime Minister said, well, how about you pay me a million pounds and we won't build another ship. The Prime Minister knew that it would take just a month to get a boat from England to America. And who knows how long for Congress to make up his mind. And he put forth a two-week deadline on how long they could come up with this money. So J.P. Morgan went up to George Peabody and said, well, we, we need this bribe. We need a million pounds. This was $2 million. Well, George Peabody just wrote the check, handed back to J.P. Morgan. He gave it to the prime minister, and they never built to sell another boat. At the same time, remember I said George Peabody? He was involved with um, selling cotton. Well, him and Julius Spencer Morgan were selling cotton to Europe so the self could have money to buy weapons and ammunition and clothing. So they knew how to put their money on both sides of war and still profit. And by the way, J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley was George Peabody's bank. Now here is a picture of the fountain that's in front of the East Junior Mall and in front of the Peabody Essex Museum. To the right, the lower portion, this is where a symbol of the ocean. The next layer up to the left, that is the current map of Salem. And the highest portion is the original map in 1600s. So that middle layer gives you an idea once you see it in, in person where all that tunnel dirt went to fill in all these roads that these buildings are on now and the new the, the wharfs that lead out into the ocean. Now, this is a famous house. How many of you guys ever played the game Clue? Probably most of you have at some point. So this is the mansion that Clue is based on. All the rooms on the board were rooms in this mansion. See, the Parker brothers grew up in this neighborhood around the corner. In fact, they had their first toy store two buildings away where the Hawthorne Hotel currently is. And when they bought the English game clock Cluedo and they named it Clue, they had personal reasons beyond it being in the neighborhood that this house was. For they had an uncle who was one of the original High Federalists named Isaac Parker. Isaac Parker became the State Superior Court Justice for Massachusetts. And after a murder had happened in this house, since this was a capital offense, he was going to be the person who heard this case. Well, one night he's heard saying he's never been in better health and he's never missed a day on the bench and he would die three days later. Now, remember that three days because it starts to get interesting. Well, this is a picture of Daniel Webster. He was a senator from Massachusetts and he was part of this triumphant that was made up of Henry Clay and John Calhoun leading up to the Civil War. 
Eventually, he would become Secretary of State under President William Harrison. You might actually be a little bit more familiar with him underneath this guy's. How many of you remember Sam the Eagle from the Muppets? Well, Daniel Webster, this is who he was based upon. Just Daniel Webster's might have been just a little bit uglier than Sam the Eagle. Now, here's the three people who are actually committed. Well, actually, these are the three people accused of the murder. Two of them would hang for it. The third one, George Crown and Shield, he would actually get off um, because he got off the night before. Uh, two women came forward and said that he was actually sleeping with him on the night of the murder. So he didn't get to stay in jail too long. And this here is supposedly the weapon that killed the old man who resided in that house that the game Clue is based upon. Now a little more background in, in this uh, murder. Not only did the Parker brothers find influence for a board game, Edgar Allan Poe had based the telltale heart on this murder case of the Captain Joseph White, who was the first privateer in town during the Revolutionary War. So the murder story goes, supposedly on record, even though it's maybe not the truth, that Richard Crown and Shield, George Crown and Shield's brother, sneaks through a window and comes up to the second floor and he bludgeons the old man over the head, then takes a dagger and stabs him 16 times. But there's no blood splattering on the sheets or walls. They accuse the Knapp brothers of hiring Richard Crown and Shield. Now, R Richard Crown and Shield, he was a guy who owned the local saloon down off of Peabody Street, off of Lafayette, and, and the, the brothels attached to it. He was running men back and forth through the tunnels to his establishment, and also the tunnels over there in Peabody, where the Crown and Shield ta um, tanneries were, were now apartments that his father had built. The question is, if he did the murder, why would he use the window and not the tunnels into this home that was connected? So they said the Knapp brothers had paid for him to do this murder. So Richard Crown Shield sitting in jail He's reading about mathematics. He's reading about engineering. He's joking with his jailers and he has a cocky look on his face. The next morning, they would find him hanging from the neck from his own silk handkerchiefs from a low window with his knees almost touching the ground. How do you hang yourself that way? So they free the two Knapp brothers who brought in his accessories. Because if they can't prove that the man who you think did the murder, who they paid for to do it, if they can't prove that he did it, how are you gonna try these two others as accessories so they're set free? Well, the thing was that uh, Stephen White, we mentioned him a little bit earlier, was the nephew of Joseph White. He will hire Daniel Webster who was the father-in-law of his daughter. And also his other daughter married Daniel Webster's brother-in-law. So he would hire Daniel Webster to come and try the two Knapp brothers a second time. I guess they never heard of double jeopardy at that time. And eventually Daniel Webster would get those two people hung. Now, there's a little bit more to the story because what started off in implicating Crown and Shields and the Naps was a letter, a blackmail letter. And it first came to town to uh, Gideon, Dr. Gideon Barstow. And the blackmail letter had said that if you don't pay, 
he was going to tell everybody that Stephen White did the murder, the nephew of the man who got murdered. Now, Stephen White's brother-in-law was Associate Superior Court Justice Joseph Story, and they were neighbors. And Story leaves his backyard and runs across to Stephen White's backyard where he sees him, lifts the, Stephen White from the shirt collars and says, why'd you kill your old man? Why'd you kill your uncle? And Stephen White shrugged it off, said, I didn't do it, no. Soon afterwards, a second letter shows up in town and it's going to accuse Joseph Knapp. So, previous to this, in the years 1827, Stephen White's wife dies. So he's a bit distraught. This is also the year that Joseph Knapp Jr. comes back from overseas on one of his ships. He's going to come back to town and get fired because Joseph Knapp Jr has been sending love letters to his cousin, Mary Beckford. Now, Mary Beckford was living with the old man who was going to be murdered. He was the old, she was the old man's grandniece that he was having an affair with to have a last chance to have an heir or a child of his own named after him. Now, Joseph White had two business partners. One was Joseph Knapp's father. As you could figure out, you know, Joseph Knapp's son, Joseph Jr., would be the same name if Joseph White had a child of his own. Now, Joseph Knapp had bought the ship, the Revenge, from Joseph White in the past. Now, this is an old man who, whose wife had died and left him childless. So at this time, when he sold this boat, this boat was his only baby. This is the boat that he became the first privateer in Salem with. This is a boat that made his fortune. And his business partner, Joseph Knapp Sr., lost it to the pirate English. Remember the name of the boat it's called Revenge? Well, Joseph White also had another business partner who um, thought did him wrong as well. So, up to the, leading up to a point in the 1800s, we had the Embargo Act. And Thomas Jefferson said that no ship should sail to any foreign ports leaving America. So all these Federalists who were, hated Jefferson from the start anyway, now even have more reason to hate him. So at a point, I believe it was the, um, Jefferson and the President afterwards continued the Embargo Acts, and then it were lifted. And all the Federalists are happy because now they can sail their ships off to Europe and they don't have to listen to any of these Democrat Republicans anymore. And as soon as they could, they sailed off three ships from Salem to go off to Naples just to get confiscated by General Marat and Napoleon's Navy, or Army actually. So his other business partner, Richard Crown and Shields Sr., could be heard in a tavern, probably the Sun Tavern, which is now where the offices for the Peabody Essex Museum is, which also is connected to tunnels to the that museum. He probably could be heard over a round of ale going, Jefferson was right. Look, we sailed three ships off to uh, Europe, and as soon as they get there, Napoleon's army takes them and confiscates them all. Well, this could have been embarrassment for Joseph White. So he's going to need a little revenge against him too. And remember, it was Richard Crownishield Jr. was to be the first to hang. And then the two Knapp brothers, Joseph Knapp Jr. and Frank Knapp Jr. and Frank Knapp would also be hung as well. So through Stephen White, his nephew, who probably had a mercy kill him, bludgeoned him over the head, and then went back afterwards when it didn't look like it was a ghastly enough crime, stabbed him 16 times after he was dead. And that's why there was no blood on the sheets. Now it's been three years since Stephen White's wife had died. And three years since 
Joseph Mapp Jr. married Mary Beckford and eliminated Joseph White's last chance to have an heir. Remember I talked about that Judge Parker? Well, he was going to hear that case. And it was three days before he died did he say he has never been in better health and never missed a day at the bench. Remember, this connection to the Parker brothers leads up to the game that all the rooms in that mansion were based upon. And also they would keep one name from England, Mrs. White, because Mr. White was murdered in this house. And there's a couple things that could have bludgeoned the old man. And then the dagger that had stabbed him. And then the rope that hung all the innocent people for this murder. The other funny thing about 1827, this magic number, we already have one with three, but three years since the man's wife had died, Stephen White's wife had died. And three months after Joseph White's murder, and three days after he said he's never been in better health, Parker dies. We get that number three. Now we get to number 27. So after the murder on April 27th, the Knapp brothers have their carriage robbed on the way back to their farm in Wynnum. Also, the Committee of Vigilance, who was a goon squad who harassed the town to try to find out who did the murder, there was 27 of them on that committee. And it was also said that maybe there was a $2,700 reward for the capture of the murderer. This case becomes one of Daniel Webster's most famous cases. It's broadcast through all the broadsides and journals throughout the country. He becomes a very successful senator, which leads him up into um, the graces of Henry Clay. Now, Henry Clay, maybe the first time he came in contact with Salem was at Vincent, who owned a rope walk um, off the Salem Commons. He wanted to know what the advantages of hemp versus jute. Now, Vincent was using jute and uh, Henry Clay was a hemp farmer out in Kentucky. So Henry Clay came to Salem to talk about the advantages of hemp to Mr. Vincent. And maybe while he was here, did he come in contact with Daniel Webster. Now, either maybe through Stephen White's acquaintance, you know, bringing Danny Webster to town and the, the murder that we've been talking about, or maybe Henry Clay met him when he was Secretary of State for John Quincy Adams. Not sure. But either way, uh, Webster would move up eventually to take advantage of that position. And his son was serving under William Harrison during the um, Tecumseh War, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. This was a famous um, a rallying cry leading up to Harrison's election. Now they figured that, you know, with the popularity of William Harrison, being a war hero and all, that they could get him elected president. And the thing about Stephen White and his two um, friends related through marriages, Associate Superior Court Justice Joseph Story and Daniel Webster, was that the two of them, including Nathaniel Silsby from Salem and also Secretary of the Navy Benjamin Crownishield, were directors in the Second Bank of the United States. Now, when Jackson revoked the charter of that bank, Jackson didn't come to Salem or Boston even to visit Daniel Webster. He went to visit Stephen White because Stephen White's uncle, the man who was murdered, left him great shares in the Second Bank of the United States. So not only was he losing a lot of money in these shares, George Peabody was losing a lot of money in his shares and he had to take the gruff of the English bankers who were having all these states go bankrupt and not pay their debts off as long as the bank wasn't there. So these people, Story, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, decided they needed a puppet. And this war hero, William Harrison, was going to be their candidate. 
the first to suffer from Tecumseh's curse, but not be credited yet. Now, they get William Harrison in office, and Daniel Webster, he decides he's going to write the president's inaugural address. And William Harrison says, no, no, no. I will write it myself. And he writes the longest inaugural address in history. He delivers it during a snowstorm, which leads to a popular rumor that a month later he would die of pneumonia from exposure a month ago. Sometimes people, when they read history or listen to stories without reading it from themselves, not the smartest. So leading up to his death, William Harrison started to become an independent thinker. When Henry Clay came to the White House and demanded him to make the Third Bank of the United States, Harrison barred him from the White House. Daniel Webster also was forcing him to make the Third Bank of the United States. Harrison denied he wasn't going to do it. He will die a month in office of typhoid. Now, back in Salem, Stephen White, he owned the chemical factory that was off the North River on the, um, the gas station side of town there. Also, Stephen White was the man behind the power of Daniel Webster and Joseph Story. So could they have knocked off the president using typhoid? Well, is there any precedence to any of this? I mean, who else in history might have been uh, assassinated through typhoid? Maybe the first that's recorded was Alexander the Great. There are rumors that he was, had his food poisoned by typhoid. There was a woman up in the 1920s murdered seven husbands by typhoid poisoning. There was a doctor around the same time who murdered off all his in-laws through typhoid. Plus, we have the famous Typhoid Mary. She would inadvertently make you a hamburger and kill you by spreading typhoid. So, how can you come across typhoid? Well, usually typhoid spreads when you take a local uh, water supply and have the sewage leak into it. Just have to take a sample of water like that. And in Washington, D.C. at the time, there was such contamination going on. Put it in a bottle, shake it up, and drop it on the president's food. Only problem is after they knocked him off, his successor, uh, Tyler, he wasn't going to make the bank either. And then we go through Polk is um, elected. He was actually from a different political party as this cabal that we were mentioning. And not only did he not create a third bank in the United States, he created the independent treasury. Now, independent treasury removed all the national funds out of state and national banks. So none of these corrupt bankers inside the country were profiting, nor the corrupt politicians and bankers inside of England and other countries who profited from us. One side note. Now, if Adams and Hamilton created the first bank in the United States during the second presidency, and they sold over 70% of the shares to England. If England's holding 70% of our nation's wealth, who really won the American Revolution? It's one of the reasons why Jackson got rid of the second bank in the United States. So Polk, three months after him leaving office, would die a typhoid himself, or in some cases they mentioned cholera. Uh, a lot of times that in that day, cholera and typhoid will get mixed up in, in coroner reports. So after Polk leaves office, now Stephen White, he might have planned this idea in the first place, but he only lived a couple months after Harrison. He had liver problems, so he went to put a topical solution on his liver. And also, he was drinking another remedy that he was supposed to mix with brandy to help his liver. Go figure that one out. But by accident, somehow, 
he drank the topical solution, which poisoned him. And a couple months later, in August, he would die himself of liver problems, probably complicated by that poisoning. So through Polk and the next president, Taylor, afterwards, Joseph's story was around maybe for a hand in the demise of Polk, but he would be dead by the time Zachary Taylor takes office. Daniel Webster at the time was a very successful senator, still working with Henry Clay and Calhoun, trying to keep the country away from civil war. And, and as a side note, um, he's still trying to create the third bank of the United States. So they decide to have a, another war hero, Taylor, to come in and be elected president. They want him to make the third bank of the United States. He gets in office and he says, no. They try again. They go up to him in Congress and say, what happens if we change its name? We call it the Fiscal Bank. He's like, no, it's the same thing with another name. And Congress wasn't fooled either. Well, he will live 16 months in office and then die a typhoid himself. And then he will be followed by Millinard Fillmore. Now, Fillmore um, would actually hire Daniel Webster to leave his lucrative uh, Boston law firm, leave the Senate of Massachusetts, or for Senate for Massachusetts and U.S. Congress, and become his Secretary of State again. Well, Phil Moore doesn't want to create the bank either, and it wasn't until um, Wilson that we would have the Federal Reserve, which is the third bank of the United States, with most of its shares held in um, foreign corporations, mostly from China, Japan, and believe it or not, Ireland to this day. And I believe England held the eighth of most shares inside the Federal Reserve. So it comes down to our last story. This one has to do with the property where the Hawthorne Hotel is now. Now, originally this was called Andrews Corner, then Wakefield's Place, then the Franklin Building. Now, when it was the Franklin Building, it was bought by a man named Thomas Perkins. You might know him. He is the one who founded the Perkins School for the Blind, uh, the Perkins Library that lands off audio tapes and braille books off to those blind people. And also, he's the founder of Mass General Hospital. Now, a lot of times back then, you don't become a philanthropist because you had a kind soul. It's more like a guilty soul. Well, he was at Supercargo, as mentioned it earlier, that sailed on Liza Haskett Derby's ship, the Grand Turk, which was the second ship to sail off to China from America. So he made great acquaintances with the Hongs, who the wealthy that were inside of Hong Kong in, the, in mainland China. And he suffered the same problem that the British had suffered, was that um, China always had unfair trade balances like they do today. They usually don't want much Western goods. Eventually the British found out that they did like tea. And it did offset that trade balance a little bit, then they found out that they could sell them Afghanistan opium and it really offset that trade balance into the favor for the Europeans. But with the problem with the opium came the addicts and crime. And when that became such a pinnacle of a problem, the Chinese decided that they'll make the drug illegal and kill all their addicts. Well, the British and most of these Boston Brahmins, like Thomas Perkins, were going to stand to lose a fortune from this. So it wasn't that favorable. Now, right before the Opium Wars, now the Opium Wars were created so the British could force the Chinese to buy opium from them, and there was three of them, when the um, drug was illegal. Now, right up to the before the Opium Wars, Thomas Perkins started feeling nervous about being known as a drug dealer. So he would give it to his daughter's um, sons. One of the sons, who would be a later successor to his firm, was John Murray Forbes. 
beforehand, his brother had had it, came across the sea and drowned before he made it to China. So their cousin, John Cushing, took over the firm. Now Cushing became the favorite of Ho Kwa, who would die the most wealthiest man in the world at the time from his connection with selling opium from the Perkins and the Forbes. So if you ever wonder where the Forbes Fortune 500 starts from, now you know. Here's a picture of his other brother, and also Ho Kwa, who made a fortune off the Perkins here. Now, while the drug was illegal, what they were, most of these Boston Brahmins and the British were doing was smuggling the goods to the Portuguese island of Macau. And from there, people like Ho Kwa would send boats over to smuggle the goods into China and sell it further. Now, it was one of the four brothers to go up to Perkins when they found out that the drug was going to be illegal. And they asked his opinion about it. And Perkins had said, well, it's great for business because you really have to have really the gumption to stay in it when it's illegal, that most people will back out. And in truth, he did end up having almost a monopoly in the field after families like the Delanors, Delanos and the Astors backed out of the trade. Eventually, Sturgis Russell would purchase his drug empire, and he would continue employing the two Forbes brothers. Now, Sturgis Russell's brother, William, he was the one who founded the Skulls and Bones with Alfonso Taft. Alfonso Taft was Taft, or President Taft's grandfather, and it was an organization that they founded at Yale after a debating club had kind of gone sour with them, that they made their own. Now, William Russell, knowing Thomas Perkins firsthand, would actually buy his property in New Haven, and on that property that once was Thomas Perkins, they would build the crypt where they have all those infamous rituals and things that those undergraduates from Yale's attend. On a side note, it was George Herbert Walker Bush who probably went through a bunch of rituals inside this location here, who also was born in Milton, down the road from John Adams, who he was related to, was born in that town Milton, where the Forbes and Cushings grew up. Remember that story I said about how do they feel about, you know, asking Perkins, how does he feel that the drug is illegal? And he said, well, it's better for competition. Remember, it's George Herbert Walker Bush who led the war on drugs makes you wonder, did he start their war on drugs in South America, get rid of them, or get rid of competition? Well, thanks for watching.